Aloha and welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and joining me today, I'm delighted to welcome a young leader here in our state of Hawaii, uh, Representative Jackson Sayama. Uh, uh, welcome to our show, uh, Jackson. So, Representative, thank you so much for joining us and, uh, and sharing some insights. Uh, we have a fascinating topic. Uh, let me just first give you a quick hello and ask you to, to just say aloha, welcome, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what's ahead. But again, thank you for joining us. That's good. Well, thank you so much for having me, Carlos. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Big Tech Boy. I was always watching it uh, back when I was still in school. So I'm really excited to be on and I'm glad that uh, we could have this conversation today. No, well, thank you again. And uh, this is a show called Global Connections, where we really discuss and we explore a range of issues that are maybe globally oriented, internationally oriented in different ways, uh, different mm -hmm. subject matter experts. Often I, you know, as a professor myself, uh, actually now a retired professor, I'm, I'm now working at the East West Center. Uh, but I still work with a lot of international programs, but I'm excited because as a young leader yourself, in so many ways, you help us uh, both see and, 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 and basically recognize the importance of what, what I call global education. And uh, I want to take a moment to explain that because I think, uh, uh, you know, we know often this term international or global. And, you know, often if we go into look at universities, for example, where we do a lot of our, let's say, our higher education training, you know, you might have a course, you might even have a program that is international in its orientation. But that's different. When we talk about global education today, we're really talking about remarkable changes so that today you have universities uh, that are now uh, connected all, all around the world and with campuses worldwide. And I want to use you as a chance to help illustrate that because tell us a little about yourself. You're obviously a local boy here from uh, Hawaii. Uh, you today represent now in the House of Representatives of the state legislature, uh, the uh, district that is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, St. Louis Heights area above UH. And, and, that's and, uh, uh, the old seat of Calvin Say, of course, and well, uh, you have come to it in a curious way because today you're a state and local official uh, dealing with all the you know issues that entails. But your background, while you grew up here, took you to do your studies abroad, in, in, in specifically at New York University's Shanghai campus. So maybe just by way of helping some of our observers know uh, and the listeners know a little bit more about your own background, you know, you're a young legislator, but you've got this fascinating story, having grown up here, having gone to school here. But finishing high school, unlike so many others that maybe go to the mainland or stay here in Hawaii, you chose to go to China. So tell us a little bit about your background and, and, and how that came about. Sure thing. Uh, so I was born and raised in uh, St. Louis Heights uh, and went to Hokulani Elementary, then Punahou down the street. Uh, and while I was at Punahou, uh, I studied Mandarin for about seven years, uh, as well as attending a Chinese uh, language school in Kaimuki called Tsuchi. Uh, and it was really that transition of studying uh, matter and, and its culture in, through textbooks uh, that I became interested in uh, studying uh, China. Uh, that being said, I didn't know much about it um, other than maybe at the time the Olympics was a big thing in 2008, as well as uh, maybe some issues regarding climate change and uh, air pollution. But that was it. Um, and, and knowing its language, knowing its importance in the global uh, geopolitics um, and its economy, I thought it was important for me to know more about China and to bring that knowledge back to Hawaii. Uh, so actually, you know, I was have the opportunity to go to Shanghai, uh, really kind of check it out before committing to NYU Shanghai, but I was really amazed at the infrastructure, the culture, the people, uh, its governance. And so I decided, hey, like, this is something I could learn a lot from. And, you know, I hope to bring that experience, that knowledge um, to Hawaii and really grow it as a legislator. No, well, thank you for sharing that. And, and of course, you, you touch on a few things that are worth, you know, uh, let's say elaborating a bit. Um, as a student yourself, you went to Punahou School, which is one of our, you know, uh, local private schools that obviously has its own focus on a lot of global issues, a, a global connection in so many ways, the Woe Center and others. Uh, but you also have uh, some of our public high schools that, that carry that out with the uh, International Baccalaureate that's offered in a few of them. But uh, of course, that helped spark your interest. But I think, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, you began uh, Chinese language studies quite early. And that, of course, is critical because it helped to not just only understand how to communicate, but one of the things I always underscore about language learning is that it helps you get into the mindset to understand the values, the, the way that a different culture might see the world, right? Just because how the language is more than just, again, uh, you know, translating a word, really understanding more of that. 
Um, and here your interest got sparked early on. And, and like you said, well, you didn't know anything about China, even though you're studying it. And uh, I couldn't help but relate myself as a young college student. I studied a lot about China. This was a long time ago. It was the whether it's understanding the Civil War or, or the, you know, the rise of the Communist Party system, et cetera. Uh, I'm talking about the 70s and 80s, long before the, the China that we know today is very, very different. And, and uh, it hit me, even though I've been a college professor for years and had studied and taught about it. I myself didn't actually visit China until about 2008 or nine, uh, similar to what you mentioned, the Olympics. And it is eye opening. It's one thing to study and even study a language. It's another thing to suddenly find yourself there immersed. And so in your case, you, you selected a, a campus, uh, and this again illustrates the globalization of the world today in China, and now for some years, you have a number of international campuses. In other words, campuses of foreign universities that are operating there, many from the US and as well as some other places. Uh, describe, I mean, uh, maybe some of that context, because again, it's not like you're going to China to study at a Chinese university, and yet there are, there are foreign nationals who do go to, you know, Tsinghua, maybe some of the other elite schools, uh, uh, throughout, uh, I'm trying to remember in, in Shanghai, Fudan University and mm -hmm. others, they have a, a global connection as well. But in your case, NYU, New York University has a campus there, uh, as do others. And tell us a little bit about how that plays out, because they are in American universities. Obviously, an American student like yourself can go there, but it, I imagine they also have other international students and local Chinese students who might be immersed. So what is that like there? Sure. So, uh, like you said, NYU Shanghai is an American university, uh, and it, it really was an experimental uh, pilot program, uh, a joint uh, project between NYU and the Chinese government. Uh, and so with that collaboration, uh, the student body uh, represents that. So each grade is 300 students, half of which are Chinese nationals, the other half the international. And each, I guess, cohort of students, the international demographics change uh, considerably. Uh, but it, overall, it's an incredibly diverse uh, student body. And uh, in your freshman year, uh, the, the university will have you room uh, with uh, a Chinese national, if you're international, and vice versa. Uh, this way, um, it, it's not so much of a culture shock uh, to international students uh, transitioning to life yeah. in Shanghai. Uh, so having that uh, you know, roommate uh, really helps uh, international students who are not familiar with the culture, the language, uh, get used to life there um, in the city uh, as well as the school. Um, on, on often I get asked, you know, oh, okay, so are the classes taught in Chinese uh, and, you know, it's no, uh, unless you're in a Chinese class, of course, uh, most, uh, yeah. if not all, uh, classes are taught in English. Uh, and the curriculum uh, is something uh, very similar to uh, other American universities. Uh, in access to information, for example, same access we get if I were to be in New York City, New NYU. Uh, of course, that's limited to the campus. Um, if we were to go off campus, you know, you would have to use a VPN of sorts, um, but you still have access to that information you need for your studies or otherwise. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And what you describe in many ways also, you, you are also describing uh, aspects of what we might call experiential learning. So it's not just going and taking a class, your experience there connecting with a local Chinese roommate. And for that same roommate, him having a foreign national that comes and, and you know, he learns about your culture, your state, your background. Um, that is also a key part of it, uh, you know, and one of the things that we know from uh, a lot of experience of studying abroad, it's often common that students will tend to congregate and sort of stay together with their own, and, and that's understandable if you're in a foreign land, but often it takes away from your ability to fully immerse in the culture. If you only, if you go to study in Paris and you're only hanging out with all the American students or whatever it might be. Uh, so I, I'm pleased to learn of that, and I think that comes from experience, understanding the, you know, both also your own, let's say, assimilation or uh, ability to function there, because it's a different society, it's complex, different rules and norms. Having that roommate kind of gives you sort of a, a, a nice helping hand, right? Um, and, you know, one of the other maybe challenges, because on one hand, you described you're, a, you're an NYU student, you've got the same access and tools, and yet you're living in a different society and, and, and China for you know, whatever we might describe it is not the same open society that we know in the US and maybe other Western um, uh, cultures, uh, uh, there's more, you know, let's say uh, 
political control, more, more dissent is more frowned upon. So are there challenges there? Uh, moreover, as you well know, in, in recent years, we've seen dramatic protests of, in neighboring Hong Kong over challenges there for political autonomy. <clears throat> and of course, China with a history of suppressing dissent. I don't know what you can share about it, maybe how the experience was for you living there, accommodating it, because you come from a pretty open and, and maybe liberal oriented, uh, even your educational background, uh, the education you would have gotten there, Punho would be, you know, instilling in you, you know, questioning and, and critical thinking and, and things that, you know, we, we, we continue in higher education. Uh, and yet with China, again, uh, there is that concern that maybe, you know, uh, I don't know, did it play out in any way for you? Were there any challenges, uh, obstacles, I don't know, curiosities, things that you can share? Yeah, so like you said, I think that was one of the most valuable uh, lessons, experiential learning, uh, as you referred to it, uh, for me, at going to NYU Shanghai. Um, it's that chance to look critically, not only at my worldview, but also, you know, what life is like here in Hawaii and the U.S. and comparing that uh, to the Chinese way of life. Uh, and certainly there are uh, really uh, concerning um, policies, uh, like you mentioned Hong Kong as well as Xinjiang in recent years, Taiwan, of course. Um, but uh, while I was there, none of that really affected me personally, um, especially because during my time there, those issues weren't front and center. Um, maybe my senior year in Xinjiang uh, started to become an issue, but uh, it was still, uh, and it's, uh, I guess it's just starting. Um, and when I was there, like, uh, when it comes to freedoms, I suppose. Uh, there's always something you recognize when you go to a Chinese city, it's all the cameras uh, on the streets. Um, and to me, I was like, you know, I don't personally care too much about that. Um, one thing I noticed in Shanghai was, despite it being such a popular city that, you know, even during late nights, people are still wandering around, it's an incredibly safe city. Um, I felt perfectly safe and my classmates felt safe wandering the city that night um, through these dark alleys. Um, and we could only feel that security because of these cameras. Um, now, of course, that's a double-edged sword, um, but it's kind of the difference in governance. Um, uh, you know, you could have your freedoms, uh, but that comes at a price. Um, similarly, if you want more security, that comes at the price of privacy. Um, but uh, admittingly, I was very impressed uh, by the efficiency uh, in which the government was able to promote uh, development uh, in the private sector, but also uh, promote certain agendas uh, in the public through their educational institutions, uh, through even uh, their public transportation systems uh, that were extremely clean, extremely efficient. Um, you know, that, that gives people a sense of comfort and as well as a trust that, hey, you know, the government can do well. Uh, it, it could help my life in many ways. Uh, yeah. I don't, you know, unfortunately in Hawaii and the U.S., I, I don't think there's that trust uh, between private citizen as well and government institutions. Um, but of course, uh, to each their own in uh, Chinese society, if you ask a Shanghainese citizen, you know, they might feel great about the government. Ask someone else, say from Hong Kong or Xinjiang, you'll get a very different answer. Uh, so, you know, it, there really is the, a big difference uh, in society with winners and losers. And who gets to determine that, you know, is uh, very arbitrary uh, to a certain degree where in the U.S., uh, minorities are, are protected, um, you know, despite our challenges, uh, relatively minorities get a voice in government uh, and have rights. So that's something, you know, I was always, uh, I guess, jostling in my mind uh, when I was studying there. Well, it's fascinating because, it, you know, especially as a young adult yourself coming of age, you're, you're, you're questioning these things, you're looking at it, you're experiencing it. Now you've come back, you're reflecting on it in different ways. And, uh, you know, I, I, get, I go back to my own uh, rather shock when I, when I finally traveled to China myself after, you know, many years as a professional and learning and teaching. What, what I saw, in, particularly in Shanghai, because I did visit other areas, but Shanghai was this amazing uh, dynamism and optimism and, and vitality that it, it, 
it, it made it clear to me that this is not the, the you know the, the Chinese growing up, let's say in these last 10, 15, 20 years are not the same Chinese as their grandparents who came of age at a different time, building the country under you know, a different form. Um, uh, and so it, it is quite remarkable. And, and, and maybe on that, a, a valuable way to turn the question now, because here you come back, you finish those studies, you've now you know, established a, a, a career here back home. Uh, and now you're a new legislator. You, you were elected uh, this past fall into the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, and so you're dealing with state and local issues. And yet at the end of the day, you've got this global perspective that helped inform you. Uh, you've got perhaps insights, experiences you've seen. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just remarking, or I'm, I'm thinking remarkably like in what I saw in Shanghai at that time, I had a chance to visit some of the construction that they were doing and learn about the urban development. And when you see the contracts here in Hawaii, the decades of, of, of you know, efforts to try to build a rail system and ongoing since you were, you know, gosh, you know, uh, you've seen it, it hasn't arrived. In China, that would have been built in six months. They probably would have lost some people along the way. Obviously, not much in the way of, let's say, civil society groups, environmental groups, cultural, you know, issues. And that's a trade-off. Yeah, you can get things done quickly, but it's at a cost as well. Maybe the way things get done. Uh, you also describe maybe the attitudes towards government, which is also very different. And it's also different in Hawaii than it might be in other parts of the U.S. mainland, uh, partly because of the nature of our own story, the nature of our culture and society. Uh, and of course, in the case of China, like many other East Asian cultures, you know, deference to authority, you know, maybe the legacy of, you know, Confucian ethics and, and you know, people look to leaders if they are delivering, you know, in, in, a, in a, let's say, in a different way than often in the maybe more individualist US, you know, where we're critical of government, et cetera. Uh, but let me ask you this, uh, having now come back and seen that and experienced and had this sort of global education, this global learning, you know, in what ways has that prepared you to look at the challenges here at the local and state level and maybe bring different solutions, different ideas, thinking outside the box? I mean, what, what are ways that you can say your experience as a young, you know, now global leader working at the local level uh, has prepared you? Well, it certainly gives a context to how or where Hawaii is operating in the world. Like you compare, you know, Honolulu to Shanghai, you know, most, I guess, technically cities, uh, but yeah, it's vastly different worlds. Um, and, you know, uh, it's to it has its advantages, like you mentioned, uh, for example, the Chinese culture uh, people are much more receptive uh, to new technologies and new systems. For example, in the three years I was living in Shanghai, we started with paper currency. People were still using that in my freshman year. By my senior year, no one was using paper currency, much less card. It was all uh, electronic uh, currency through WeChat. Uh, and, and it was an incredibly efficient system. Uh, I, I know there are some initiatives trying to launch those same uh, programs here in the U.S. and Hawaii, but it's difficult uh, for people to accept that kind of change, uh, even if that change makes life more convenient. Uh, so understanding uh, people and where, how their culture affects uh, their, uh, you know, perception of certain technologies, certain systems, uh, I think that's incredibly useful, uh, especially as my role as a legislator. Um, maybe some things can be pushed now, uh, but maybe others cannot be. Maybe they're too radical. Uh, perhaps they need to be introduced at a more slower pace. Uh, so uh, I think there's that. Um, but also, the world is no longer independent. Uh, you know, like this whole pandemic, uh, one area of the world could completely affect the rest. Uh, and so it's important to have uh, understanding, to have empathy also of the rest of the world. It's like, yes, I'm a Hawaii legislator, but I also need to care about other areas of the world because that affects us, our life here in Hawaii. And if we don't pay attention to that, then we're living in a false sense of bubble. <laughs> you know, um, and we're not, we can't legislate, we can't lead uh in the best way we can uh if we continue to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world yeah no you put it very well and and what you describe it as this maybe this 
world that's coming together, you know, the, 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 the interdependence really of, let's say, the pandemic. It may happen far away. It may have begun in, in, in a laboratory in Wuhan, China. But at the end of the day, the world, the whole planet is affected. But that can be said of so many other things about trade and commerce, about conflicts that get sort of globalized because of the many interests and, and so on. Um, and, you know, one other thought I had is that, you know, you are yourself part of a, a generation of young Americans that is now, let's say, more globally oriented and connected in your own way. Um, and likewise, a country like China today has a growing number of, you know, young professionals, people who are more connected to the world, certainly than their parents and grandparents. Uh, and that are, you know, there's even in, in the curious paradox, you know, China, this, you know, communist party rule is also a very aggressive form of state-led capitalism. You know, the government helps to stimulate and support and in some ways give tremendous advantage to certain, you know, large enterprises all over the world. And, and, and you know, interestingly here in Hawaii, we know from our tourism that, you know, Japanese are obviously very critical and, and, and you know, increasing numbers maybe from China and Korea, but never at the level of what we traditionally had. I'm speaking pre-pandemic, uh, but that's changing as well. And, and again, today, this new generation of young Chinese, and I wonder, because I've seen it in my own lifetime, you know, for some 30 years, I've been an educator. And, and I can tell you that the, the wave of Chinese, uh, whether they are government officials or, or, or business leaders or just young professionals, they are much more savvy today and much more aware of the world in ways that, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, they were not. Uh, and from your vision and, and maybe what you saw there and, and maybe the young Chinese that you have been able to connect with, um, you know, how do you see them? Do they, in one way, on one hand, they, they, they are still part of that, let's say, Chinese culture, and yet they are increasingly well-connected and very savvy at working across borders. Uh, and, you know, anything you can share just as a reflection about that? I mean, again, the New York generation of young Chinese who are, you know, in some ways, like you've done yourself, connecting to the world. So, yeah, like, aside from NYU Shanghai, there are hundreds, I'm sure, of programs that connect, you know, Chinese uh, citizens, young students uh, mm -hmm. with the rest of the world and vice versa. Uh, and so my hope uh, is that in my generation with so many uh, young students uh, kind of experiencing different parts of the world, different people, uh, that when they grow up and get into positions of power, that they are better able to, uh, I think, lead in a more empathetic way. Uh, like, I think right now we've seen, especially during the Trump administration, uh, considerable fear of the unknown. Um, and that fear, you know, I understand it, uh, but with some outreach can be mitigated um, and developed into a more trusting relationship. Uh, and so with more and more complex issues like global warming, you know, we need that kind of collaboration. We need that kind of cooperation between different nations, between different people. And so I'm hoping that my generation can provide that kind of leadership. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And in so many ways, it, it requires a, a, a level of what I would call citizen diplomacy, not just the traditional government to government, uh, and even the, you know, maybe business interests that are very strong, but even people to people. And just as you've done as a young, you know, student traveling there, you've now developed some friendships that are going to be lifelong lasting. And in 10, 20 years, people that you're going to be able to turn to who you knew from back then. And let me ask you as a final question, because, you know, you are now uh, as, as a legislator here in Hawaii, you are in a very valuable way um, able to, how shall I say, uh, help foster those connections and links in different ways. Um, in other words, Hawaii, and, and maybe I ask you more question: how do you see Hawaii in its future role? Because we are remote and isolated, and yet we are also a bridge. We are also a clear connection for the U.S. mainland and, and you know the country as a whole to Asia. We're a window. We're a, you know we've got expertise and experience here, but also beyond that, I mean, where does Hawaii fit in your mind? And maybe reflecting even on as a student there, people were probably intrigued. Oh, you're from Hawaii. That that creates you know a certain image that's different from saying that you're from Los Angeles or from Atlanta. Uh, so where do you see Hawaii and its role? And you know anything you can share about that? Sure. So with after Obama. Uh, I guess, pivot to the Pacific. I think Hawaii has an extremely uh, unique role in uh, diplomacy uh, amongst the Pacific powers. 
Uh, and so I like to call it the Geneva of the Pacific. Um, you know, nowadays we have uh, formats like this uh, through all lines or through, you know, some kind of phone call or even a plane ride over. Uh, I don't want Hawaii just to become a flyover state. Like, you know, I want people to be able to come here to discuss the issues uh, that we need to cooperate uh, through. Uh, so attracting that kind of opportunities for international cooperation, you know, like the Pacific Forum we had uh, or APEC, uh, I think that's where Hawaii can shine uh, in terms of really uh, growing its international influence and elevating its position in the world. Yeah, no, very well said. And, and you know, and obviously related to that is we have opportunities as you certainly can help foster too to share and showcase what Hawaii offers to the world. And it could be as simple as, hey, we have an indigenous culture and society here that understands the importance of connecting to the land and, and using our resources, you know, so that today, well, sustainability is the, you know, the hot topic. Guess what? It's been practiced for many, 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 uh, you know, millennia here and in other places. Uh, and beyond that, little stories, you know, success stories that we may have, interesting examples of, you know, innovative things happening at our local level that we can showcase. And, and you know, so Hawaii is not just the, you know, Lilo and Stitch or the honeymoon uh, attraction place, which it is, but it's more than that. And maybe even just to the final point, we are ultimately this Geneva of, of the Pacific is, is how you called it, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and it, is a, it is a place that brings together many resources, uh, a lot of expertise, myself at the U.S. Center, other, you know, institutions in town, foreign policy especially is very critical as you know, given our important defense industry here. So Hawaii, I think with yourself uh, as a future, um, you know, ongoing leader is going to help connect to the world in more ways. So let me again, thank you. Uh, this has been a great opportunity. And I, I look forward as we, you know, in, in days ahead, we can have another chance to talk about some other issues, things that are on your uh, agenda in particular. Uh, but this has been a great opportunity to, well, uh, to, to understand how global learning has impacted you and helped shape you as an our young legislator uh, and helping our audience understand, again, uh, this world of global connections that we have so many. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to close and thank you so much for this opportunity, Representative Sayama, joining us today from the House of Representatives here in Hawaii. Uh, aloha and be well. Thank you. Aloha.